This is Reframe, the podcast from the College of Education, Health, and Society on the campus of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. It's a pretty pivotal time for school psychologists today, especially as we continue to hear about the debates between parents and teachers and administrators and politicians, all about how to best ensure the safety and productivity of schools. Guns and violence certainly have been big topics in the news recently, but there's also many other more day-to-day concerns that students in schools must also manage. So in this episode, we talk about the critical role that school psychologists play, how they help schools address some of their more serious concerns, and even about some of the ways that we can all help students live emotionally healthier and more productive lives. So thanks for talking with us today. Can you maybe just start by introducing yourself and tell us what your title is, what you do? Sure. Amity Noltemeyer, professor in school psychology at Miami University. So what are, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about what a school psychologist does? Are there times when people say, oh, you're a school psychologist? Well, then you must do X, Y, and Z. And you have to say, no, really, it's more, it's more about this and less about that. And Uh, Are there misconceptions like that? And also, how has the role changed in recent years? Yeah, I think there are several common misconceptions about what school psychologists do. Many people think that school psychologists do primarily counseling, so that they're working, you know, individually with students in a counseling or therapy type situation in the school. Um, But school psychologists can engage in counseling with students, um, either individual or small group. That's often not the largest part of our role and function. So, The role is pretty varied, but it has changed pretty dramatically over time. So when the field first evolved, school psychologists really were considered the gatekeepers of special education. So really that assessment role, when a student didn't meet the expectations of the school, they were often referred to the school psychologist to do assessments to see it, you know, what the most appropriate educational setting would be or if they required special education services. And so that gatekeeper role really persisted for quite a long time, but now we realize those decisions about special education eligibility or about a student's placement are really a team decision, and the school psychologist is just one member of the team who brings a certain amount of expertise, but the the field really is pushing more towards prevention, early intervention, um, and school psychologists, I would say more now than 10 years ago, are doing more school-wide work. So. It used to be that school psychologists did work with just those students with the most intensive needs. But now school psychologists are involved in building wide initiatives such as positive behavior interventions and supports for the whole school and working with teacher teams on core curriculum issues, social emotional learning, that sort of thing. So that's another change that I think we've seen in the field is this transition from only focusing on the students with the most intensive needs to realizing it's a continuum of supports that's needed in a school, ranging from general prevention work and helping with the general curriculum to then the students with the more intensive needs. Okay, that seems like a, a lot of things to focus on right. for one person. <laughs> Especially when you talk about this idea of students being on you know a continuum, because I imagine I imagine all kids deal with stress and anxiety and frustration, at least on some level, right? It's just part of being, you know, just it's part of life. So, but on one end, you have people that just have a normal amount of those things who could also probably use help and support. But on the other end, you probably have students who clearly need a lot more support. So how do you balance that while trying to consider everybody, the students who may need a lot more of that attention? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it is... Uh, school psychologists are oftentimes working with schools to do some sort of screening. Pretty much every school probably has some form of academic screening in place, but more and more we're trying to get some sort of behavioral, social, emotional, mental health screening in schools to kind of establish early on students who might be at risk for certain things, Uh, might be at risk for, you know, some sort of mental health issue, anxiety, something like that, so that we can address those issues before they escalate and become, you know, more routine and more interfere with the students um, functioning. And then looking at the data and seeing are there students that we could provide some early intervention services to, some small group supports or something like that. But it is a challenge. The hope is that if we can address things with more prevention and early intervention, that we won't have as many intense needs. And so there has been some research to suggest that that is the case, that we can 
reduce those numbers if we focus more on primary prevention. So for example, with um, behavior, by teaching social emotional learning skills to all students and by modeling those and reinforcing those in different environments, we can reduce the number of behavior problems. It won't eliminate them. But by doing that, then we can focus the attention that we have on students who do need more intensive support. And what are some of the major challenges that school psychologists face today? Overall, are there like certain challenges that many, if not all, school psychologists have to manage? Sometimes we know what works best for certain students under certain contexts, but that doesn't mean that the school necessarily has the resources to be able to implement that intervention with fidelity. So, you know, it may be that a research research studies have consistently shown over time that a particular intervention is um, very effective for, let's say, students with conduct disorder or something like that. That doesn't necessarily mean that the school has the personnel and the training, you know, rapidly available to be able to do that for every student who would need it. And so this knowing what in an ideal world might be a very good approach to a problem doesn't mean that it can actually always be implemented as you would like. So I think that's a challenge. And then I would say another challenge is that, in my opinion, anyone who's involved in a situation with a student who's having challenges, either academic or behavioral, in the vast majority of times, everyone involved has the student's best interest in mind, but oftentimes they differ on their interpretation of what that is and how you achieve it. And so a school psychologist oftentimes has to mediate some conflict between different parties who all want the same thing for the student. They want them to be successful, but they have very different opinions about how that needs to happen. And so I think an important part of the role of the school psychologist is to try to keep the end goal being making sure we're doing what's best for the student, um, but trying to understand the different perspectives and you know, while we may differ in how we think we want to get there, we're all striving for the same thing and try to like at least get on the same page so that everyone's willing to move forward in a productive way because sometimes there can be disagreements about what that is. So earlier you mentioned, this is a question I always have when I hear about things in the news. Uh, you met, You talked about how schools are moving towards more intervention and prevention and support, but like outside of school, the larger cultural conversation, especially when you hear all the news about, you know, things like gun violence, whenever there's an incident, the whole conversation in the news, politicians, parents, everyone, it seems to focus immediately towards like more security or more legislation. And it always seems more like way more reactive than proactive. It always it always seems very curious to me on why that that seems to be the focus and not the prevention or proactive approaches. Yeah, that's a great point. So one thing that the field has transitioned into is school psychologists are becoming more involved in something called threat assessment, which doesn't necessarily mean um, threat of guns, threat, threat of gun violence, so it could be. But basically any time um, that schools, more schools now are having procedures for any time there is a concern about a student that maybe they haven't even made a direct threat, but there is some feeling or concern that maybe that student poses a threat or could pose a threat, that there's a series of kind of procedures that are gone through to see, is this just a transient threat or is this something very serious? Is this something that we might need to intervene with or not and how. And so I think that that, although it seems reactive, it is a bit more preventive because oftentimes these things escalate. So I think that we are trying to catch things earlier um, and not ignore what later might be seen as red flags, things that have happened that indicated that maybe this person is experiencing either a threat for violence or some sort of mental health issue. I also think an important thing for me, I, I agree with what you're saying about that we tend to be reactive with these things. And um, I think that schools are doing better with like reasonable security and safety measures. Um, I think those are important to have those in place. I think some schools, because of all of the gun violence that have occurred, have begun being more extreme in like the measures that they're taking to ensure physical safety. And I think that to me, we have to really balance students psychological and emotional sense of safety with their sense of physical safety because sometimes like research on there's been some research with metal detectors for example that's shown that just the mere presence of those can actually make people feel less safe um, because it indicates that there is some sort of threat Mm -hmm. 
So I think that schools really are gonna have to grapple with how do we balance the need for students to feel emotionally safe in this space with the need for us to put in measures that make that may make them feel physically safe. So I think it is a, it's a struggle. So I think that we have a lot of work to do um, as we move forward and yeah. I heard an interesting point made by an expert a few months ago in the news on, it was on the increased security issue and he talked about like why in the world would we wanna make schools seem and feel more like prisons? Cause prisons, like they're not safe places. Right, exactly. So I think Obviously, this is a concern that we don't want to ignore, but we also don't want to engage in some sort of knee-jerk reaction that that institutes very restrictive, harsh, you know, security measures. For example, the issue of of arming teachers. Most national organizations, including the National Association of School Psychologists and the National um, Association of School Resource Officers, would oppose that as a strategy for a variety of reasons, and so. I think as we move forward, for one thing, I think over time we are learning a bit more about um, school shootings and some effective types of responses and prevention strategies, but it is, everything is kind of emerging. And so I think school psychologists, they do bring to the table, along with several other professionals in the school, this understanding about students' social emotional development that can kind of help in that conversation. But outside of that environment, like it seems, again, our culture at large just seems to be either unaware of that or it doesn't see it as a practical way to solve these kinds of problems. Because, again, you ask, you know, you hear from the average politician and it seems like the answer is always like straight to more security or more legislation. Why is it never, hey, what about more mental health awareness and support? Like maybe that's the best way to go. Yeah, I agree with you. And when you think about some of the solutions that have been posed, the cost to some of those solutions is extremely expensive so that you know to arm all teachers would be an extremely expensive proposition and I think we would get you know far more bang for our buck if we could put that money into effective mental health programming and there are there's no magic solution to this problem necessarily but there are we do know there are certain evidence-based interventions that can reduce people's risk for violence so you know, there's no one size fits all solution, but there are options that we that not all schools have access to. You know, not all schools are able to provide evidence based programming for um, mental health or for violence reduction or violence pre- prevention. So, um, so I agree that in the conversation we need to be talking about more funding for mental health supports, and I think schools are an ideal place to do that because not everyone is able to access community supports for various reasons. Um, You know, there are some communities that are geographically isolated from any sort of mental health support for children. So, or they don't have the funding to do that or various things. So I think schools are ideal because students spend a great deal of their time there and, you know, it can improve access to the services. That was literally going to be my next question. Like, it, it are it, as if schools are the you know an ideal place to provide mental health services and support. Yeah. Yeah, and I I think that schools are doing a better job of coordinating with community mental health support nowadays. Many schools do have community based providers that work in their schools. So schools obviously have mental health professionals in the school, but sometimes also partnering with community supports can be useful. Yeah, recently I talked to actually a Miami educational psychology graduate who was just named as one of the area's top nine leaders in education. And he did talk about whenever possible how he does network with outside therapists and counselors. So I guess at least at some local schools here that is happening. And it also reminded me something else he said, which I think this might be relevant. He talked about how one of his main goals is to give his students the tools to cope with frustration and stress and anger because like you know that's just part of life right so there could be one incident in the present that they have to work through but stuff like that will inevitably happen again right because that's just part of life like down the road we'll all feel angry or frustrated or stressed out so he talked about building the tools so they have that toolbox to rely on for success you know going forward i think you're absolutely right and i know when i was a school psychologist i did have the opportunity to do some small group counseling and that was really what we focused on was coping skills and coping mechanisms because you're right students 
are always going to experience adversity and some are going to be very mild you know adversity some are going to be more severe trauma but no matter what to have those skills and to have the opportunity to practice those skills of dealing with interpreting understanding and moving forward when you're faced with challenges i think is a lifelong skill so i think that's a very good point and i think we as school psychologists can help students with that but i also think that teachers do a powerful job of that too. And so we can help by the language that we use in the classroom. So for example, when a teacher um, faces an obstacle in the classroom, it might be something as minor as, you know, the overhead projector is not working and she can't get her PowerPoint up on the screen, you know, something very simple like that. The language students are very observant and whether or not they consciously realize it, they're internalizing how the adults that they see are coping with challenges and failure. And so, I think that there's really simple ways that we can teach students those resilience and coping skills just by modeling it ourselves. And particularly with regard to mistakes, like viewing mistakes as opportunities rather than, you know, real serious setbacks, I think is important. So, so I think we all have the capacity to make real simple changes in our behaviors and language that can have a really profound effect on students and because students do look to the adults in their environment to understand how to respond in challenging times. So I think that it is important for us to self-reflect on how we behave in schools and how we react to situations so that then students can kind of see, okay, well, um, maybe I can do the same thing. That's great. That's a great message. I think that's a great way for like, for how almost everyone can help, how we can all get involved. Right. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Wonderful. Dr. Amity Noltemeyer, Miami University Professor of School Psychology. Thank you so much for being here. And there's also many more episodes of our podcast available on SoundCloud and on iTunes, where you can also leave us a review and a rating. We'd love to hear all of your thoughts and feedback. 